Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, depending on where you're based uh, in the world. Welcome to the uh, BIS uh, Economic Conference, annual conference. Um, as many of you already know, the conference this year goes virtual. Uh, we already have uh, two installments uh, of our conference. Uh, the first one was with uh, Ricardo Reis, second one was with uh, Lucrezia Reichlin, uh, and the next one uh, will be next week um, with uh, Matteo Maggiori on uh, the uh, global financial system, and I'll come back to it uh, when we close uh, this meeting. Uh, but today we are very lucky to have uh, Marcus Brunner Meyer from Princeton University and Bruno Bier uh, from HEC in Paris to uh, discuss the, uh, the future of money. Uh, and namely the digitalization of money. Um, and we're all very eager to um, listen to Marcus's and uh, Bruno's insights into uh, the, the future of money. Digitalization has become the bread and butter uh, of what the BIS does across many dimensions. Um, that's about uh, fintech and big tech uh, entering the uh, provision of financial services. That's about cross-border payments. Uh, under the G20 action plan and mandate. Uh, that's also about the future of money itself, and in particular, the prospect for central bank di digital currency, um, on which uh, the BIS is uh, researching, studying, but also experimenting in the BIS Innovation Hub. Um, and there are many questions related to uh, the different uh, forms of money which are emerging, and certainly the different means of payments, uh, unit of accounts, stores of values, uh, one of them being uh, the coexistence of different forms of money. How will public digital money and private digital money, or at least means of payment, uh, coexist in the future ecosystem? Uh, and what should be the uh, public policy objective of central banks and which kind of uh, public goods should we provide to the uh, global uh, community? So uh, we are very happy to have uh, Marcus guiding us uh, and uh, putting structure on that discussion. Uh, this is a public conference. Uh, it is webcasted live. Everything is on the record. And Marcus, uh, I'm very happy to give you the floor. You have 35 minutes for the presentation before uh, Bruno uh, provides his comments. So Marcus, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Benoit. It's a great honor to give this uh, lecture here at the, at the BIS about the future of money. Thanks again. And, you know, as uh, Benoit pointed out, money is changing and uh, many old theories we have actually can be revived in a sense. There's a lot of insights we have actually forgotten. We'll come back because we have to think about the nature of money in much more detail as we move into the digital age. So you might ask yourself, you know, we have all these new forms of money in Pisa, Alipay, Libra, and so forth. Uh, what is different? Wasn't money digital to a large extent anyway? It's like if you have your checking account or banking account, that's all digital already. But that's all inside money. It's a liability of some other entity like your, your bank. But we, of course, have new forms of outside money, new currencies, which are um, sprouting up. And that's what we have to think about and what are the implications for monetary policy on this. So the questions which arise, will central banks lose their grip on monetary policy? Will monetary policy sovereignty be remain, uh, remain in central banks' hands? Will platforms steal the scenery benefits typically governments enjoy and private banks enjoy? What's about digital dollarization? What's about digital currency areas? Will private digital money drive out cash? Uh, and because of that, we have to respond to it with CBDC, central bank digital currencies. And how should we regulate uh, big tanks, big techs? Should they be, you know, regulated as narrow banks? Or should we enforce some interoperability on platforms? So I would like to start out with uh, some technological trends, uh, which I think led to the current environment. 
So the first thing is, of course, the smartphone, but what I would really emphasize is the digital platforms. We live now to a large extent in the virtual world, and especially with COVID. So we have a digital lifestyle and this digital lifestyle, we have to take into account what platforms are doing and what way we pay on platforms. Combined with that, there's a lot of data generated on these platforms, so there's big data all generated, and then we have new methods how to process this data and learn from this data through artificial intelligence, deep learning, and we get much better recommender systems, which are really, really important and really influential. On top of it, we have smart contracts along value chains and supply chains. There will be contingent payments to minimize credit risk. And there's also a lot of payment occurring in the future from machine to machine rather than initiated by human beings. So the Internet of Things is very important. And finally, there's a lot of tokenization going on. So we have distributed ledger technology, blockchains. I will focus less today on that aspect, but that's also an important aspect. And then we have micropayments. So all of these trends impact the way we have to deal with money, the way we should think about money and re-emphasize certain channels we had before. So let me focus on the digital platform aspect. And the question is, how will the I.O. of financial activities change? And it will change that we move away from a bank-centric world towards a payment-centric or platform-centric world. So traditionally, it was the case that the banks were at its center. There were lending and deposit-taking from customer B and lending to customer A. Then the payments, and payments were a little, to some extent a stepchild compared to lending and deposit-taking. Now the focus is shifting towards payments and towards platforms and then, you know, banking will be part of it and asset management will be part of it, but the information generation will occur on the platform, on the payment platform, and payment will be a big component and only one component uh, of that. So there will be other components. You will actually combine it with other information, text information from your Twitter account, all the other behaviors uh, big tech companies can observe. That will be combined with all this information. You combine all this information and you get a better recommender system. And that's essentially a radical shift away from a bank-centric to a payment-centric and also a platform, I would say, more platform-centric uh, environment. So what are the implications of that? And one is there's an inversion of power. So you have an inverse selection, what I call on. So, so far, when we thought about economic problems, we always think the customer has additional information, has an informational advantage. So the borrower, the insurance client has a, a big informational advantage compared to the seller or the platform. But now we have a platform and because of all this information the platform is collecting, actually now there's a, it swaps away from the information advantage of the customer to an informational advantage of the platform and the seller. And the platform might know more than you know about yourself. So the insurance company might know much more than you, the lender might know your default probability much better than you have an idea about it. And why is that? The reason is that you might still know certain attributes about yourself, but the statistical information to connect the various attributes, this connection, that can be much better made by the platform because it is all this data from very various millions of billions of customers and can draw much better inference and much better connections what you, compared to what you can do individually. Traditional, traditional example is a very simple example. Uh, you might like a red car and traditional insurance companies know that people who drive a red car are a little bit more aggressive drivers, hence you have to pay a higher insurance premium. That's just one simple example where you might not know uh, that um, you might be a more dangerous driver just because you like a red car, but the insurance company knows this. And there will be millions of these examples, and the insurance companies will use some artificial intelligence or machine learning, deep learning algorithm to figure this out. It might not know what's in the black box, but it can infer some statistical correlations and might exploit these uh, correlations. So we move away from a world with adverse selection to a world with inverse selection, where you infer the information and the whole uh, situation is flipped on its head, and that has dramatic implications, who gets information rent, who is enjoying a consumer surplus, and so forth. Now, these platforms, there will be competition. The platforms offer a lot of services, but they also offer a token or a currency. And the question is, what is the platform's problem and what, what objective do they solve, essentially? 
So you have to keep in mind that platforms have much greater control over digital currencies compared to what central banks have now because they know so much more about their customers and are better able to monitor or restrict the usage or punish even um, customers by excluding them. And that makes the situation very, very different. So what one has typically, a regular central bank has a social objective function about price stability and financial stability and so forth. But here, uh, there's an IO perspective, so industrial organization perspective of money. So there's an environment uh, and the, the platform tries to make certain choices in order to maximize, let's say, profit. So what are the design issues the, uh, the platform has to consider? So there are certain design issues which are very much traditional platform design issues. So from traditional platform economics, the question is, you know, what's the cost of using the platform? Is it subsidized to use the platform? So mockups and aspects like this, or privacy aspects, how to design the platform. But there are also then monetary aspects. If the platform issues token, there are also monetary aspects. How much do you charge if a customer wants to swap its own local currency into this token of use in the platform? Can it be negative to lure people in? How much do you charge to get out of this token into a, a common currency again? So what's the out of token fee? There might be a Berlin Wall that you can't get out anymore, so you're locked in and this. And then the platform also has to decide, like any central bank, at what growth rate you uh, let the money supply grow and what's inflation on these tokens. And essentially, one you can think of what uh, there might be a way to lure you in, and then you're caught in, in this trap, and then you can't get out. So to some extent, some of these platforms might be designed as a Hotel California, where you can get in, but once you're locked in, it's very hard to get out because those out-of-token fees are high, and then you can inflate away the value of these tokens, and that gives another revenue for the platform. Now, what's also interesting is one has to decide and think about competition across platforms and each platform coming then potentially with its own token currency. Um, so what's, what's a public, uh, what the first competition is with the public money, with the dollar, with the euro, with the yen and so forth. Um, and of course, the competition is very asymmetric because the official currency does not have a profit maximizing uh, objective. So, and there will be perhaps less of a digital convenience so that you cannot so easily use it compared to what's on the platform. There might be, there are no exit costs from the, if you use some official currency, you cannot actually charge somebody from getting out of it. And monetary policy is very much based on, you know, maximizing price stability and uh, financial stability and economic growth. And there will be a digital dollarization. To what extent is public money and then disadvantage on that. And to what extent has public money, uh, the official money, has to act uh, to that. There's a second form of competition, and that's across private platforms more generally. And then the question is how to regulate the competition between the private platforms, and what's about interoperability, uh, what's, you know, uh, other aspects about convertibility. Should you impose a narrow bank approach that the private platform has to really uh, have reserves, 100% reserves, and can't do a fractional reserve banking approach? These are all open questions and interesting questions uh, to think about, and I will just touch upon in, in this uh, short and brief uh, presentation. Now, the first thing you have to think about, when is a token on a platform really a separate uh, currency? When is it a digital currency? And this way, if it is a separate currency, it can, see, it can be seen what we coined as the digital currency area. So there might be new digital currency areas uh, popping up and uh, how to think about that. And of course, each token has a huge complementarities with its digital platform. It's not geographic, so typically when we think about currency areas, we think of certain geographic areas. It's in a different dimension. It's in, in the cyberspace, essentially. So it might be a diff, social, different social network which forms then a currency area. And if you use this particular token, you might get enjoy certain price discounts. There might be better price discovery. There might be more transparency within this digital currency area than combined outside of the digital uh, currency area and so forth. But when is, when is it a, a different currency? It's very obvious if it's a new currency that if it's a different unit of account. So if this token is based on a different unit of account, then it is, of course, a different currency. Now let's suppose it is not it's the same unit of account. You issue some certain uh, token, which is just, you know, 
uh, denominated in US dollars, or Euro, Yen, and so forth, or maybe um, Rupee or so forth, then it can still be a different currency, and that depends very much on convertibility. Okay, so is this uh, token convertible very easily? And that comes in the exit fee comes very uh, big into play. If there's a huge exit fee, then it's really not convertible. Um, so typically, you would like to have convertibility and maintain the value. So if it's convertible, then it's not a new currency. So you maintain the value with respect to the underlying currency you are packed to. And you have this uniformity or singleness of money. So it's part of a bigger currency area. So it's not a separate currency area. On the other hand, if it's just backed by a currency and there's an out of token fee, then it is actually a separate currency, particularly if the out of token fee can be removed or can be uh, increased significantly at any point in time, then I would call it a separate currency. And it's more like a currency board or stable coin arrangement where you say that's indeed a separate currency. If really uh, something goes, you can break away. It's a little bit like a currency board or a strong pack or whatever you want to call it. Then it becomes actually a different uh, currency rather than uh, a part of a official currency. And that's what one has to keep in mind. Now, there are, of course, other distinctions as well, whether it's account-based or token-based and so forth. And uh, we discussed this uh, in the paper in detail, um, uh, you know, which arrangement is better one, what are the drawbacks and so forth. But here I would like to emphasize very much what is, um, what defines a currency, a separate currency. And the area between convertibility and backing a currency, of course, is not very black and white. It's more a gray distinction, but it's very, very important to have this uh, in mind. So once you have a currency, the, the issue is always, is that digital dollarization? So is there a, a loss of unit of account? If you lose the unit of account uh, in your country, and then you, know, you really lose the ability to conduct monetary policy and so forth. And that's related to traditional dollarization where let's say the US dollar is taking off the over the local currency and people use US dollar rather than the local currency. And how can you lose this unit of account? There are two ways you can lose it. Either you can use it, lose it because there's a medium of exchange. So the invoicing will take place in this new digital currency and this token primarily. And uh, or uh, is the store of value component to it. And these are two components that might interplay with each other, but it's either the medium of exchange or the store of value. Think about the US dollar, it's a very good store of value and it's very attractive and that's why it takes over uh, certain transactions, certain people saving in US dollars. But on the other hand, you might still use your local currency as a medium of exchange. And these are two dimensions. But if you think about the renminbi, it might you know gain some foothold because of the medium of exchange because many, many uh, countries will find it more convenient to pay with this new electronic ways of paying. So for example, I have several Chinese friends in, in the US, when they order some food in the Chinese restaurant, they pay with Alipay or WeChat pay to the Chinese restaurant owner. Uh, and even though both the restaurant owner and the customer, they're both based in the US. Um, and it's a transaction within the US, but occurs through uh, the Chinese system. Uh, Alipay and so forth. And this is essentially, you can see a digital dollarization going on, which makes, it's very similar to uh, the traditional dollarization that initially occurs very slowly, but then it's suddenly the highly nonlinear effects and suddenly the unit of account uh, is gone. And who, which countries are most vulnerable to that? Are typically uh, small countries like in the regular dollarization and uh, and countries which have a large informal sector and also the digitalization in countries where they don't have an official uh, efficient uh, electronic payment system. That argues that the central banks on the official sector should really set up a good electronic payment system to make them less vulnerable uh, towards um, uh, this digital dollarization. And of course, you're also vulnerable if you have a social media presence. Now, what are the defense lines? So when would you, you know, as a citizen, not like to have a digital, uh, you know, dollarization or that's uh, what can you prevent, what can prevent a digital dollarization? And one, of course, is that the ultimate digital dollarization is when debt contracts and deposit contracts, you park your money with your digital wallet in a different currency, in a digital token and so forth. 
And when would you be reluctant as a customer to park your wealth or you know, your savings in some digital wallet in a different token rather than and the official currency. And that's the case when you think that's very secure, the token is very secure, there's no default risk. And the lender of last resort power is very, very important because this gives the official currency a huge advantage compared to private currencies because the government has essentially a taxing power to back up its local currency. And that makes you know, the official currency um, more powerful in a sense. The other aspect is a defense line. If you want to introduce, you have to introduce a CBDC in order because cash is getting out and is becoming a more and more poor substitute for all the uh, more increasingly digital transactions. So you would like to offer some alternative, at least in the background, wholesale CBDC to, um, to be present in this stage as well in order to defend a digital organization wave. And, and then another way to is, of course, if you have stable coins, you force 100% narrow banking arrangement, uh, where you say every um, digital token some big tech company is issuing has to be backed up with the official currency 100%. And of course, I mentioned already the regulation um, and so forth. But of course, we would like to have at this stage also some uh, exploration and invention going on in this space. So there should be not over-regulation at this stage, but I'm sure the clear principles should be worked out and uh, make sure that there's no abuse of uh, the public uh, good aspects of money. Now let me come to so what we have so far. Uh, I talked a lot about the private big techs and then we have the banks and we have, of course, the official sector. And typically what we have at the moment, we have very much a two-tier system and I alluded to this already. So you have the government is very much focused on outside money provision. So that's money. What is outside money? It's uh, a debt government debt with infinite maturity. So it's never coming to you. You can never go to the uh, government to get something in return. Uh, so it has infinite maturity. And, uh, and then there's, of course, inside money, which is then issued by a private bank, which is a liability. So it has finite maturity and has to be rolled over and has some rollover risk. And the government is also, of course, doing setting the, typically the unit of account and the settlement issues. In the future, we, we have to think of a governments, banks, and big tax. So it will be much more uh, triangle, uh, with triangle arrangement, whether not only government and banks, but we also have the big tech companies to take into account. And then there's various examples how to interplay that, what role should the government play, what role should be the big tech companies play, and so forth. Now let me go move, and I alluded to this already, to monetary sovereignty. Uh, what is monetary sovereignty? What is the power to keep um, within the public sector and you know, what are the different elements of monetary sovereignty? And I would like to distinguish between four different elements of monetary sovereignty. One is senior rich, so the power to generate senior rents from money creation. That can be, you know, you provide a good store of value of money. You might even have a financial repression, and that's actually a huge perk to the government. And of course, private companies would like to have that too. So that's essentially a big advantage. And I will allude, I will expand on this in the next slide. And, and then the next thing is, I think what's probably the most important aspect is to control monetary policy in order to stabilize the macroeconomy and, and the business cycle or financial cycle. And that's essentially the, probably even more important than senior rich. Okay. And then the question one has to think, what is the important aspect in order to keep control of monetary policy? What should be the private public arrangement be to make sure we maintain power over monetary policy to manage the macroeconomy or the, the cycle in the economy? And the most important aspect here of, out of the three roles of money is the unit of account. How are monetary transactions measured? And that's uh, really, really important. It's more important than the store of value for the senior rich aspect, and it's more important than the medium of exchange. It's really the unit of account which uh, matters. And these three forces and these three ways uh, the money has, unit of account, store of value, or medium of exchange, they can be separated. They may not appear in a bundle anymore with these new technologies, but the unit of account one really has to uh, maintain. Why is the unit of account so important? 
So one is, of course, there's an inter intratemporal aspect to it. We like to measure, and you give a gut feeling, it's a behavioral, psychological aspect. It's much more natural for somebody living uh, outside of the U.S. to think in centigrades in, when they think about temperature rather than Fahrenheit. In the U.S., it's the other way around. So there is something, you get a feel for money for value, uh, and that's a behavioral thing. But the intertemporal aspect is it leads to redistributive forces and risk-shifting effects. So if you think more of a New Keynesian perspective, where it's all about price thickness and the way it's invoiced, how is money invoiced in the US dollar, in the local currency, or in a uh, producer currency, in a consumer currency, this all matters. These are the key decisive elements. And when you do monetary policy, you shift essentially wealth and risk around. Now, what's it from a financial fiction's perspective? It's much more how debt is denominated. Okay, so is debt denominated in the local currency? Can you have some token denominated debt? Or even if you just have a wallet with a lot of wealth, if you change the relative value of this um, of tokens versus other money or long term versus short term, uh, you change the value, you redistribute wealth. So you monitor policy redistributes and transfers risk by doing so. So you can recapitalize certain sectors or shift risk around. And that's how monetary policy works uh, in these type of models. And it works through the unit of account. It works in the denomination, uh, the currency. Uh, and people are holding. So if they change the debt in a different currency, it makes radical differences, makes radical impact on the power of monetary policy. And if everybody holds tokens in a particular a different unit of account, you can change your interest rate around. Uh, it doesn't do anything because people hold a different way of tokens. Now, what's another form of monetar monetary sovereignty? And we talked about this already. It's the power to bail out. Uh, the power to provide liquidity of lender of last resort. And of course, the government has the taxing power, the fiscal space and the governance to do this, to decide, okay, we will help out this particular bank, but we will not help out that particular bank. Of course, you have to have a clear governance in place. But if this is in the control, uh, if you have banks which, you know, issue some uh, or some entities, and let me not call them banks, issue some entities which issue some token deposits, uh, in a particular token, then the token provider can decide which entities to bail out and which ones not to bail out. And should it be uh, in the hands of um, uh, the, you know, this private company or should it be the hand of uh, democratic uh, uh, power? And the fourth one is the power to exclude from the monetary system. So you also have the power to shut somebody off. That's a huge power. And I think from a democratic perspective, probably the most important one, you can exclude people from being part of the community. Suddenly say, you don't get a, a certain ability to pay in this token. You exclude it. Of course, it gives a huge power also to the platform to enforce payment and reduce default risk. But it's a huge power, you know, to what extent you are not allowed to exclude people from uh, the monetary system. You can weaponize essentially your token. We see that to some extent that the US is doing this uh, against Iran or North Korea, but this could be done on an individual basis and excluded and a public entity would never exclude particular citizens from the payment system, even if the citizens have done, you know, have defaulted on certain credit or something like that. But that this power to exclude is, I would say, another a fourth dimension of the monetary sovereignty. Now, let me go a little bit more into the Sinorich uh, debate here, just to understand what is Sinorich and, uh, and uh, see how we can deal with that. So in order to understand Sinorich, the rents for money creation, I think it's very useful to think of asset prices, and money is a particular form of asset, if you think in terms of store value, that each asset price of each asset, whether it's money or some other asset, is expected present value of cash flows plus the expected value of service flows. And I think this component of service flow is very important. So if you think of cash, you know, there's no cash flow at all. If you think of reserves, there might be some cash flow, it pays some interest, again, in, in terms of money. There might be some cash flow, but the service flow is, is the key here. And so that's the way one has to generalize asset pricing. You would like to include a second term here, and that's the present value of service flows. And so the different ways of service flows, let me jump here, so which leads to this convenience yield. One is that, you know, there might be 
a good medium of exchange. So cash is a good medium of exchange. You might, in analytical terms, you might have a cash in advance constraint, and that you know cash is relaxed in this case, cash in advance constraint. So there's a Lagrange multiplier showing up, and this present value of this Lagrange multiplier essentially increases the value of cash, even though cash is no cash flow. Okay, so that relaxes this double coincidence of wants thing. The more interesting aspect, I think, is the store of value aspect as, as a safe asset. Okay, what's a safe asset? A safe asset is an asset which is around when, you, when you're in need. So it's like a good friend. I call a safe asset the good friend analogy. When you need it, it is around. So people have shocks. And if it is in cardiac shocks, you face a shock, I face a, a different shock at some different points in time. And we cannot ensure these shocks because they're so specific to us, but we can both hold certain safe assets. And when I have a negative shock, I can sell it to you. And this selling to you is a transaction that gives me some additional value. That's the service flow. And it comes from the possibility to retrade. So if you have a huge market liquidity in these assets, think of government debt, then it gives you additional service flow that you can ensure uh, through precautionary savings and retrading. So this retrading is, is very, very important. And that leads to a different perspective asset pricing, and you get this additional uh, service flow from that. So for example, if the 10-year treasury suddenly in the US has a higher bid ask spread, it becomes the service flow would go down and hence the asset value would go down as well. So what happened in March 2020. And this has huge implications for that. Of course, a third way you can have this service flow is you have some additional collateral, so you can use it very well as a collateral asset. So it relaxes some collateral constraint. That's another service flow. So if you have two assets which have the same service cash flow, but one relaxes the collateral more, but then it, the, the latter, um, has a higher service flow and has, has a higher price, or i.e. a lower cash flow yield. Now, what is senior rich? Senior rich means that if you th look at this, you, you hold a lot of assets which have a lot of cash flow value, but low ca service flow value, and then you issue some asset which have low cash flow value, but high service flow value. Okay, and this could be even a bubble. So if, if the cash flow value is zero, it would be a bubble component. So you don't have to pay anything. So the cash flow value means you don't have to pay a lot of cash flow in terms of interest payments. Uh, you get the higher of cash flows. It's because you're long debt and you're short in your liabilities. You're short of assets which have a low cash flow value but high service flow value, and that's your great zinerage for banks. Okay, and governments do the same thing. And then you. Uh, issue more, you have a certain growth rate of this and create more and more synergy. But you can see there's synergy on the government side, but there's also synergy on the private banking side to the extent that can, they can generate liquidity uh, in, in this additional service flow. Okay, and that's uh, that will be shifting away. This will be actually moving uh, to the big tech companies too. And how much of this uh, benefits private banks are getting and the big techs again it depends very much how competitive. Uh, the setting is. Now, let me illustrate this. And the synergy also depends to a large extent what the private banks are getting. It depends on the introduction of CBDC, so central bank digital currency, to what extent you know the private banks can still enjoy that or not, and is it moving more to the government sector uh, as well. Or if you don't do any CBDC, to the extent that the cash is going out, to what extent the governments will actually lose the scenery from the cash usage, because cash becomes less and less prominent and important. So this leads me to some work I did with Dirk Nippelt on you know, what happens if you issue CBDC, what, can you issue it in a particular way that actually it remains equivalent, so it doesn't change the macroeconomy at all. Um, and that's you know what's in this little economy here. So we have the government and the central bank, we have a, uh, think holistically from an economic perspective, uh, combine them, merge them. And the government, you know, of course, has a lot of government debt, government bonds, but the central bank is holding some of the government bonds. And, and it also, the central bank has some reserves or money, or CBDC in this case, which then is held by the household. The government bonds are held by the households, and the, the households they also own the government and the central bank. So there's implicit uh, government equity held by the households, and there's a primary surpluses from the tax revenue minus expenditures. That's a present value, hopefully positive, uh, by, by the governments, and that's what the taxes has to be paid by the households. So that's uh, to get the whole. And then you have banks, and then you have firms 
banks lend to the firms, and the equity is always held by the households. So the firm's equity and the bank's equity. And importantly, the banks issue deposits to the households. The households hold money to the central bank and deposits to the, to the private banking sector. Now, if the central bank is issues a central bank digital currency, what happens, of course, it crowds out deposits. That creates a problem for the banks. Um, and then you have more money uh, issued by the central bank in form of CBDC held by the households. But it can be that the central bank is just passing on uh, then this additional funding it observes, or it obtains from uh, the governments from the households in form of CBDC, it passes on to the private banks and then you can keep everything neutral. The paper argues more, most generality how you can maintain this neutrality, but that's the basic idea uh, that you can actually pass on the funding to the banks at what interest rate you have to pass it on. That's the same as the deposit rate before. And you have also have to make sure that you have some deposit insurance in place. So implicitly, you also pass on a deposit insurance which is in place in many countries anyway. So let me uh, conclude and sum up. So what I argued here is that if you look at all the technological trends, in my view, the biggest one is the digital platforms. So you have a new ecosystem and we live a large part of our lives on this ecosystem. So of course, smartphones are equally important and tokens as well. But the data which come with the digital platform is a huge advantage, which give big techs a huge advantage. And banks might become big tech companies as well, exploiting this uh, information advantage. Of course, the platforms generate a lot of data, but we need machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence to be able to use this data. And that's where uh, new elements come in. So there will be an inversion of the industrial organization of the financial activities. There will be a competition, how we regulate this competition uh, among the platforms. So there will be competition between the platforms. That for this, we need the interoperability, convertibility, and there will be competition in form of these platforms open, uh, offering tokens and money. And these tokens and money have different forms and have some limited product, have some product differentiation. There will be some monies which are very much focused on privacy protection and others will not be focused on private protection but offer you a high interest rate. So there will be different forms of money floating around and different people will prefer a different forms of money. And the, the competition between the platforms is one form of competition. And then it's the competition between the platform providers and the money on the platforms and the official money. And then there's this danger of digitalization. And we might then have some non-geographic digital currency areas. And we argue at the end of the paper, what matters a lot is in privacy regulation. And to the extent that the privacy regulation is geographic again, we might get back to geographic digital areas, areas as well. But most importantly, monetary sovereignty has to be preserved. But I think the focus to some extent should be on senior rich, but to a large extent how to manage the macro economy. That's, I think, the more important component to preserve for central banks. And uh, CBDC and the lender of last resort is important to maintain the unit of account because that's a critical element to maintain the unit of account of your local currency such that you can then manage the macroeconomy. And this will actually have then triple effects. If you have this transformation and this digital currency areas and so forth, it will have ripple effects on the international monetary system in the digital world. And I would like to end up with a little thought experiment. If you think about what changed, the big changes in our world, of course, the internet, but the music industry went to, through huge transformation and Napster played a very, very important role in this transformation, but it is not you know, very heavily used. Uh, it's probably not even around anymore. Now we have different forms of distributing music, but it played a critical role as a catalyst to change the whole industry. And Bitcoin and Libra might do the same thing for the payment system, more broadly also for money. And that will be give us, gives us a little bit of an inkling what we will, should expect in the future. But whether then Bitcoin and Libra will be the ones which will dominate the future monetary system, that's a different question, but there might be the catalyst to trigger it. And thanks again for listening to me, and uh, I'm looking forward to Bruno's uh, discussion and the debate afterwards. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Uh, that's a lot of food for thought, and uh, thank you also for meeting the time constraint in a so uh, disciplined way. 
let me give the floor to Bruno Bier for the discussion. And Bruno, you have 15 minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Marcus, for a great talk. Um, and let me see if, I, yes. So that's the kind of paper I like, you know, very pure, very simple. Of course, this is more the, like the paper that Marcus presented. It's, it, there's more moving parts. And so it's very difficult for a discussion because there are so many interesting and fantastic things everywhere. You know, there's a little bit here and a little bit there and something here. So I chose to only talk about a subset of, of the, all the fascinating issues that Marcus raised. And I'll try to summarize and then raise issues. So one of the bits that we can tr start from to summarize is to start from the three functions of money, unit of account, means of payment, and store of value. And we can confront them, compare them to the three functions of digital platforms on which you can construct reputation for being a good driver or a good seller, on which you can match users, uh, and on which you can make recommendations and use all sorts of artificial intelligence to um, make propositions to people. So one of the points made by Marcus, and I thought that was a very interesting point, is that uh, digital platforms could unbundle the three functions of money and rebundle them with functions of platforms. So, for example, you could think that uh, Libra, which now is called DM, would not really be a unit of account because it will have a fixed. It should be. It should have a fixed exchange rate with dollar. Um, it would not really be a store of value. Maybe not at least in the first uh, steps, but it would be a means of payment. It would be something you would use when you want to trade on the platform. So then what Facebook could do with Libra would be to take the means of payment function unbundled from the other functions of money and rebundle it with um, the functions of platforms. So by doing this, hopefully, Facebook would be able to make its own platform even better, and the services it would bring would be even better, and that would attract a lot of people to use both the services of the platform and the payment services it offers. So, as I was reading, so that's that's one of the the, the analysis that we have in uh, Marcus' uh, paper. Now, I ask myself, how would that work? Um, so maybe what would do what? So what would happen would be the following: If I want to buy, buy goods on this platform, I first have to exchange some of my euros against tokens issued by the platform. Then, possibly, if it works through a blockchain, that transaction would have been to be validated by the blockchain. Then. I would use the platform to search for the good and inspect the reputation of sellers. And then I would buy the good and pay with the token. That would be another transaction that should be validated on the blockchain. And then if the seller whom I paid with my tokens wanted to use them outside the platform, then the seller would have to con convert those tokens in euros. And that transaction would have to be um, again, validated on the blockchain. So I think that's one of the business models that Marcus um, outlined when talking about um, the role of digital platforms uh, when it comes to money and payment. So maybe it's interesting to ask ourselves in this context, uh, who's in charge? And so who's in charge of the validation of the transactions? Um, uh, from what they say on, uh, about Libra or DM, that would be what they call a permission blockchain, which is that the validators would be people that would have been chosen and controlled by the platform. So basically, Facebook would appoint validators who would validate all the transactions made on the platform and not validate those that they don't want to validate. Another thing is, 
Uh, that token, at least in the, in the proposals that are currently floating for Libra or DM, that token would be what they call a stable coin. So basically, uh, they would dip. So when you buy tokens with euros, they would deposit those tokens on a safe account. And for each lira, a Libra or DM that they issue, they would keep one euro on the safe account. All right. So that's, that's my summary of one of the aspects of the paper by Marcus. The paper was a bit different from the presentation, but I still think that discussion, that summary is related to what Marcus said even in the, in the presentation. Now, we'd like to raise issues with that. Um, frankly, I'm not sure we can trust the platform to manage the payment system and the currency. Uh, so take the stable coin, stable coin part of it. So the platform commits to keep on a safe account the counterpart in euros and dollars of the tokens it issues. Well, we need to be sure that they actually do that. We need to be able to control that the, the currencies are kept on the safe account. And the only example we have for the moment of a big stable coin is Tether. And in that case, we are not able to control uh, its reserves. They, they said they would give, up, give us an audit of that, but so far there hasn't been any audit of that. And there is absolutely no transparency. There's no way to know what they actually do with our money. So we need a lot of trust. Second part is this notion of permission blockchain. So Facebook would appoint validators who would decide whether transactions are valid or not. And we would trust them to keep all this data confidential and to make the right decisions when managing accounts. Again, it takes a lot of trust. We need to be really sure that they will do the job right. Now, second issue I think I have with the, with the scheme is that, frankly, when I was trying to analyze how it works, it was not clear to me that it was useful for society that all these payments be made in cryptocurrency. Uh, you know, the, the, the little scheme I described before, I think you could get this, almost the same thing without the cryptocurrency. So I come to the platform, I want to trade there, I deposit. Uh, my euros, and they're wired from my bank account to the account of the platform. And then I have an account on the platform in euros, and I can use it to buy on the platform. And the platform debits or credits accounts in euros, and then sellers can withdraw their euros payments. Um, I, it's not clear to me at all what social value is brought by relying on a token or a cryptocurrency to uh, make all this work. So, so to summarize, so we have a traditional system in which customers and suppliers meet in shops where the transactions take place, then the payments are engineered by banks, and all these guys use currencies which are managed by central banks. The problem with that arises when the financial institutions and the central bank or the government are not trustworthy. And citizens have also, when the banking system is not efficient and citizens have no access to banking. So I can imagine that Zimbabwe or possibly Venezuela are countries like that. It's a little bit less clear that France or Germany are like that. Then you have a second model, which is the model of permissionless blockchains, which are completely open, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So there again, the customer and the supplier will meet in a shop. 
The payment now will take place on the blockchain. And instead of having a central bank managing the currency, we'll have a protocol and miners. The problems I can see with that would be if there is instability in the blockchain due to forks, or if the blockchain is very costly, for example, proof of work sends a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, or if the cryptocurrency is too volatile. So the digital platforms uh, possibly will bring a third type of architecture in which now the customer and the suppliers will no longer meet in the shop, but on the platform. The payment will take place on the blockchain of the platform, and it will be validated by the nodes which are permissioned by the platform. So the problems I can see there are that maybe we cannot entirely trust the platform to manage the data and the account and the currency. At least there's a lot of uncertainty about that. So my, my possibly pragmatic conclusion, you know, what, what would be good for society? I can understand that uh, dig digital platforms would like to earn seniorage, uh, but I'm not 100% I'm not convinced it's good for society. Maybe banks, you know, central banks can do that. And, and possibly, and that here I echo what uh, Marcus said, Possibly uh, uh, creating CBDC can help uh, central banks compete with other digital entities in order to retain um, money, the management of money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno. Uh, before I open the floor for further questions, let me turn back to uh, Marcus to uh, give Marcus a chance to uh, reply to some of Bruno's comments. Uh, thanks a lot, Bruno. Very nice uh, discussion. Uh, I totally agree what what you said. Uh, in a sense, you emphasized much more what we also do in the paper that, you know, if you have this unbundling of the three roles of money and they can rebundle it with some digital platform uh, services. And I think we will live to a large extent in some digital platforms and the convenience on these platforms will be just a dominating factor for many customers. It's just so much more convenient to make these payments. But the key word you said is trust. And the trust is really needed. And so far the trust is with the central bank and with some private banks, uh, which have some auditing system. And the question is, will the platforms gain the same form of trust? Will the banks move become platforms? or will the big tech platforms begin this trust? And what, what you said also reminded me of this blockchain dilemma, which uh, I worked on earlier. Essentially, how can you design this trust? One is you can just have a reputation and you make future profits, so you have a market capitalization out of that. And if you abuse the trust, you lose essentially this future profit stream. And that gives you a good uh, reputation and you believe it. Another one is, as you mentioned, is proof of work, but it has, of course, within uh, a blockchain technology, a lot of costs, right? all the electricity costs, all CO2 emissions and all that. That's also something to uh, keep in mind. And the third one of this dilemma is essentially you have some outside verification through some the legal system or through some auditors. And, and these are the three ways, and one has to find a balance between the three. There might not be a corner solution. It might be some uh, interior solution here and there. Um, Overall, I agree with you too that uh, CBDC might play an important role here and uh, in order to bring the public sector also into the picture because the world is changing. If the world is changing, you stand still, you lose. Essentially, you have to adjust uh, for that. And that's important uh, to recognize. Oh, thanks a lot, uh, overall, for the discussion and uh, for opening it up and bringing more pictures from the paper also to the, to the floor. Thank you, Marcus. Um... I have to say I find it absolutely fascinating that after such an elaborate discussion on technology and uh, incentives and contracts, we come to the conclusion that monetary stability is about trust, which I think will be music to the ears of all the central bankers uh, around this conference. Um, and second, I think there is another very important uh, lesson for, for all of us, which is that the discussion on uh, 
digital currency and on CBDC uh, is as much a micro discussion than a macro discussion. It's as much about in, in industrial organization than it is about the macro economy, uh, which is sometimes uh, 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 underestimated in our circles. Uh, and certainly the BIS has been uh, working a lot in that direction. Uh, so let me open the floor for questions or comments. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all the uh, governors and colleagues around the table to use the uh, raising your hand function in the uh, in the chat if you can um, and uh, if you can't or if I don't uh, spot you uh, then uh, please feel free to take the floor but please use the please raise your hand as much as you can so so just as a way to 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 to, to, uh, to break the ice uh, and waiting for uh, waiting for colleagues to uh, to, uh, to warm up. Uh, um, may I ask you one question, Marcus, which is about the macro dimension? Um, and you pointed out the, uh, I mean, you had this nice discussion on digital currency areas. Uh, and I guess uh, an important question from a macro standpoint is how much will would digital currency areas coincide with optimal currency areas in the macro sense? Uh, in the sense of uh, Mundell 61, uh, sort of. Um, because if not, we, we might be in big trouble uh, from a macro standpoint. But you could make the opposite argument that uh, digital currency might help you to reach consumers and investors better, uh, to, uh, to impact on the, on the Euler equation much better than uh, the uh, usual intermediated way through providing liquidity to banks, banks providing liquidity to households, and so on and so forth. And so you have the two sides of the argument, right? That CBDC might also uh, hold the promise to, uh, to, uh, to reach better micro-efficiency. Uh, so what, what's your take in that discussion? So I think it's, it's a very important uh, discussion. So let me first say, uh, there are two aspects of this. One, of course, if you have virtual currency, you can even have make uh, fiscal stimulus payments which are expire or very targeted to do certain things. And the question one one wants this or not, how much freedom we want to give the people, but you can say, I give you some fiscal stimulus in to buy certain products, and if you, you can only use it for that. Or it, you can also get a, give a fiscal stimulus which expires fairly quickly, so it has to be used, you can't use it for savings. So you can be much more targeted in your fiscal stimulus if you want to boost the economy using a digital currency. With respect to the optimal digital currency area, it might be the case that if I often say, you know, what's an optimal currency area? If you look at some countries like India, you can think of also the, the countryside is very different than the cities. So there's also very, very heterogeneous uh, perspectives on it. And the same is true from a digital currency area because, you know, if you have a huge uh, social network, a social company which issues its own currency, its own unit of account, it might include people from across the globe. And they might have some commonalities and the shocks might be very asymmetric. So I'm not sure whether it will be an optimal currency area because the shocks inside this digital currency area will be potentially very asymmetric because some part live in, a, in very different parts of the globe compared to the other part. On the other hand, it might be, there might be from some savings patterns that might be very similar. So they might save faces a similar shock. And some of the shocks we're facing now with COVID are very much global shocks. Uh, so in this, I have not worked out the details of the optimal digital currency area, but I think it probably is not such an optimal one compared to what we thought so far, but there are probably other aspects which interplay with that. And I can also imagine in the future that we will rely much less on one currency we will probably have 27 currencies in our digital wallets simultaneously. So the whole question of the optimal, digital, optimal currency area might be mooted and might be changing dramatically too. Thank you, Marcus. I mean, that, that will remain an important discussion looking forward. Uh, as, you, as you know, the uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has been mandated by the G20 to look into the macro consequences of, uh, of global stablecoins. And when it comes to cross-border, the cross-border use of CBDC, certainly monetary sovereignty and, uh, and global stability will be also an important part of the discussion. Um, let me uh, give the floor to Agustin Carstens, who has a question. Agustin, please. Yes, thank you, Benoit. Thank you very much, Marcus, for a wonderful presentation. It's always very, very provocative. 
Uh, a key part of your analysis is the fact that you can unbundle the three traditional functions of money, unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange. Uh, and I have heard those arguments from you before. And, um, and I have always have this doubt in my mind but I was afraid to ask, and now I guess I'm not so much afraid to ask. It might be a very stupid question, but sometimes it's necessary to answer a very elementary question. Is, is how can you really do that? I mean, how can you have something that performs as a, as a unit of account if it's not a good store of value? And how can it be a medium of exchange uh, if it's not a good unit of account? or where the other thing is completely, let's say, turned off. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the way you describe it, it, it's a very functional, I would say, use of money. But, but the truth of the matter is that if at the underlying, the other characteristics were not there, probably they, that wouldn't work. So, I mean, uh, again, uh, it might be something that I'm too obtuse or to, to, to convince of the traditional mantra, but, but I find that concept hard to, to I would say, uh, build on it uh, from a, a more practical point of view. Thanks. Thank you, Agustin. So, Marcus well, and Bruno, and Bruno as well. Huh? Bruno, you're welcome to, of course, to jump in oh, whenever you want. Thanks a lot. That's, I agree. It's a, it's a very fundamental question. So let me give you my take on it and the different takes uh, on that. One is you can see that many local currencies are surviving, even though they have high inflation rate, they're bad stores of value, because everybody is using it in this country. And uh, so there's, it's very easy because you're locked in because of all these network effects using this local currency, even though the inflation rate is high and the store of value aspect because of the high inflation rate is not very good. Now, in a modern world with digital finance, I can see that I don't want to hold this local currency and I swap in and out. I, people might still use for the medium of exchange because it's caught in its legal tender and so forth uh, for this local currency, in digital form, but at the store of value, I use some different currency. I switch in and out very quickly because I can do it on my smartphone within a millisecond. I just store everything in the high interest yielding currency. And when I want to make a payment, I just swap it in this millisecond, pay for it, and the other party takes it and then swaps it back uh, in, in a higher yielding currency. And I think that's because of this new technology, it's much easier to do than it was, let's say, two, three or five years ago, where you said, I hold this local currency because I want to use it for different. That makes the competition between the currencies a different because now the low yielding currency or the high inflation currency has a much fiercer competition and this and is also then forced to have a lower inflation rate. So that's what essentially I would call it high extreme. Essentially now the currency competition is much more fierce because each component of the currency or the, the store of value aspect in particular uh, is a, a direct component and they don't compete in terms of bundles. No, that's uh, essentially what I wanted to convey and, and that. Maybe if I can add uh, uh, a word of example, maybe another example of um, a currency that is that doesn't serve one of the functions is Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin is definitely not a unit of account. Uh, but, you know, maybe some people actually use it as a means of payment for good reasons or bad reasons. And you know, they seem to be do this, doing this, and it's in equilibrium with the fact that it's still valued. So maybe Bitcoin will disappear, but for the moment, I think it's an example of a currency that is not a unit of account, but has the two other functions. Well, I, I would say to both this comment by Bruno and to Marcus is, and Marcus, you, you made the, the, the point that in some cases with high inflation currency still used. Well, you, you, you are making observation on a probably a transitional point. I mean, if inflation becomes galloping at the end of the day, everything explodes. And in the short run, you might not have more, more options you have to put with it. 
but it's not a stable equilibrium. Um, and this thing of switching from one representation of money to another might might not be the fact that 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 you know that the, you're you're really is splitting uh, or or or, or at, atomizing the use of money or decomposing the use of money. It's just that it might be that certain certain forms of money are better than others in some of the traditional functions of money. I mean, I don't have any problem saying, well, uh, the US dollar or the euro is a much better store of value than, than Zimbabwe or than the some emerging market country currency. Uh, now, in the local currency, local environment, uh, the local currency, even if it's not the best store of value, it might be the best uh, medium of exchange. I mean, if you go to Cancun and you want to pay with Swiss francs your margarita, you probably will will end up without a margarita, you know. <laughs> and the Swiss franc is a much better uh, store of value than the peso. <laughs> so, I mean, I, this is a very, I don't know, it's, I mean, I find this, a, it's a very deep discussion, but the, uh, it's something that I think we need to get it right uh, to really explore. I mean, the idea is very puzzling, and I I I, I like it, no. But uh, we really have to understand how far can we carry it. I guess the central banker Perhaps, is, is the I... one that takes the margarita away before the party ends. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus? So perhaps I can add to this for one second. Um... In the olden days, I would say you have to hold uh, the Mexican peso because in order to get your margarita, there's no way around it, even though it's not such a good store of value. But in the future, it is the case that, you know, you have your Swiss franc and then you want the margarita, you just swap it for the Mexican peso and pay your margarita and then the other party swaps it back. And of course, you might say, oh, how realistic is that in the long run? But it will limit then the central bank of the emerging economy to have a high inflation rate it might limit its monetary policy space because it can say we cannot do this at the high inflation rate because we lose the store value aspect uh, of our currency otherwise people won't hold it anymore and it's in a sense using the Mekong language it's an off equilibrium change which then will change the equilibrium outcome will lead to a low inflation uh, in various countries. It might make it, for example, more difficult to do any financial repression or other things because people can more easily switch in and out across various currencies. Okay, I have uh, Stefan Ingves uh, asking a question and then Hyun Shin. Stefan, please. Thank you and, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to listen and watch uh, this uh, very fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, what strikes me when I'm uh, listening to this, and, and, and it, it sort of shows up in Marcus's slide when you had the triangle with central banks, banks, and then you had a third category that you call high tech. And that is that, uh, particularly if you are on the central banking side, you tend to think about what you do and how things work uh, uh, only along the lines of central banks and banks. And also, uh, you talk about these things from two dimensions. One is, uh, you like to have price stability. And then the second part is uh, you'd like to have financial stability. And that's sort of as far as it gets. But what we tend to forget, and this is my way of thinking about what you are trying to deal with and tell us something about when you added high tech, is that for this to be meaningful, you also have to add transactional convenience or transactional capacity on the side of the banks and the central bank. And if that is not there, then it, things sort of move elsewhere, either to the high tech sector or just outside your own country. Because it doesn't really matter if your own currency is wonderfully stable, but you can't really use it uh, 
with transactional efficiency, then you still have a problem. And looking at it from that angle, then that's why you get this conversation about high tech CBDCs, banks, and all the rest of it. And particularly in those cases where banks, central banks, and the banks just plainly refuse to move when it comes to starting to use new technologies. And of course, that really scares the bankers, the central bankers, and the private sector bankers, but they have no choice. Because either you provide transactional efficiency in your own system, or you don't. And if you don't, somebody else will show up and do it for you. And then you end up with a problem. And no matter how you hate it and dislike it, then you end up ultimately at the end of the, of the day with a problem when it comes to executing monetary policy. Because at least in normal countries, you can't, uh, you can't force people to use their own their own currency if they don't want to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Stefan. L let me ask Hyun to uh, make his comment and then we'll uh, go back to Marcus and to Bruno for, for a conclusion. Thank you, Marcus, and thank you, Bruno, for uh, that uh, fascinating presentation and discussion. Uh, just a short question on, um, uh, on uh, uh, currency sovereignty, uh, monetary sovereignty, and the use of um, CBDCs um, uh, in other jurisdictions, in jurisdictions outside uh, that of the central bank that issues it. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, how widespread that kind of phenomenon would be? Let's say that uh, uh, a central bank issues a CBDC uh, and um, uh, that CBDC is used outside the jurisdiction of that central bank. Um, what do you think would be the determinant or what other determinants do you think um, of the uh, of the prevalence of that kind of um, cross border use? And uh, and here I have in mind you know, um, the question: To what extent is it um, a good analogy to think about uh, you know paper currency? I think we can Im certainly imagine paper currency being used outside the jurisdiction of the central bank uh, that issues that paper currency. Uh, but for CBDCs, there will be technology um, that would enable you to uh, at least track the use. Uh, so if it's an account-based system, there will be an, uh, an identity that's uh, linked to the user. If it's a token-based system, there will be a public key, uh, you know, cryptographic sort of trail, uh, like, in, like in Bitcoin. Um, and so I think uh, uh, the question here is, uh, is it really the right analogy, you know, this uh, paper currency being used outside the jurisdiction? Thank you, Hyun. Let me turn back to Bruno uh, first and then to Marcus for the last word. And Bruno, you're on mute. You know, usually people think I talk too much, but this is the first time in my life I'm too mute. <laughs> so, so, um, you know, I, I disagree with the idea that um, um, uh, cryptocurrencies are token-based, not account-based. Cryptocurrencies are account-based. Cryptocurrencies are based on blockchains. Blockchains are distributed ledgers. And so cryptocurrencies, when, I, when we transact in a cryptocurrency, what we do is we move from one account to the other. So... You know, what central banks can do on account-based systems without CBDC, I don't see what they... I, I, don't, I don't think cryptocurrencies are like uh, coins, you know, gold coins or bank notes. I think they're much more like accounts in a ledger, in a bank ledger. Thank you, Bruno. Marcus, uh, you will have the last word because we are coming to... Uh the end of this uh, meeting. Thanks a lot for, for both questions and also for Bruno's uh, comments. So th both questions are related to each other, essentially. It's all I would say convenience capacity, I think is very, very important, especially once you live in these digital platforms, uh, being part of it. But the convenience is essentially related to the medium for exchange role of money. How easily can I use it for paying something and how easily can somebody accept it, uh, this payment? And in this sense, 
uh, it also relates to Huon's question, how can you easily expand it? And like, unlike paper currency, which you mostly have as a paper currency to, as a store of value, to a large extent as a store of value, this electronic CBDC or electronic money you might use much more as a medium of exchange. So it's, it is different, but of course it has huge implications too. And it has, I think one has to keep in mind, once you use it a lot as a medium of exchange, it also comes with a lot of data. And the data is geopolitically very important. So you as a private company or as a country, if you provide CBDC, you observe the payments in another country, in this country. That's valuable information that's geopolitically very important to keep in mind. And that's where privacy regulation comes into play. If the other country then wants to protect the privacy of its citizens, it might make it harder for you to use the CBDC of a foreign country. But overall, I'm pretty sure that CBDC will be used for geopolitical reasons and also to gain influence in other countries and get the information out of that. So that this bigger picture one should uh, keep in mind uh, <clears throat> as well. Touching, uh, coming back to Stefan's uh, question uh, about the convenience of conveniently using it, uh, that's very important. I uh, just want to add on one more component is that uh, it's systemic a risk component as well. It might be very convenient, but it might also be that this tech company might go down. And then the question is, you know, what happens then? There's a huge systemic risk, operational risk component that one has to keep in mind. And for that reason alone, you would like to have a fallback option like a CBDC. If some private company is going down, uh, the citizens come back to some fallback options and it will be somehow transferred back. But the systemic risk component, which of course, with any payment system, is a big component uh, on top of it. Um, and overall, uh, it was a fascinating discussion. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity. And I'm happy to chat whoever wants to uh, swap emails or talk to me. Uh, it's, um, it's an exciting time and an exciting topic. Thanks again. Thank you very much to both of you for this fascinating discussion. Um, watch the BIS space for uh, our research and our experiments on, uh, on digital payments and on CBDC. Um, and the uh, next webinar and last uh, in the series uh, will be Wednesday next week, 16th of December. The topic will be global financial system and exchange rates. Speaker will be Matteo Maggiore from Stanford. Uh, and there will be a discussion by uh, Linda Tessar from University of Michigan and uh, Laura Alfaro from uh, Harvard Business School. Thank you very much.